Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Mr. Ronald Coleman in James Hilton's Goodbye, Mr. Chips on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we have both pride and pleasure in welcoming one of Hollywood's most distinguished personalities, Mr. Ronald Coleman. Thank you, Jimmy. And may I add the pleasure that I have in being here, too. You know, you and I have had a lot of contacts one way and another. I played the part of your hero in Lost Horizon and then again in Random Harvest. And tonight, in your goodbye, Mr. Chips, I shall complete the trilogy. I'm really very happy about that. So am I. Uh, Before we begin... I wish you'd tell me one thing. Was there any particular schoolmaster you ever knew from whom you modeled the character, Mr. Chips? Well, there wasn't one schoolmaster. There were several, and among them my own father. But you know, the odd thing is how many letters I have had from people all over the world claiming they knew of someone who really was the one and only 100% Mr. Chips. I wondered about this, but now I've come to the conclusion that my tribute to a great profession has fitted very many members of it. And now that's enough from me. Before we raise the curtain, here is Frank Goss, who has a brief message from Hallmark. There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying name on the back, Hallmark. Well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. Hallmark Playhouse, starring Ronald Coleman in James Hilton's Goodbye, Mr. Chips. At this moment, that venerable white-haired schoolmaster is in his bed at the outrageous hour of four in the afternoon. Beside him are his doctor and Cartwright, the headmaster of Brookfield. Ainsworth, Atwood. What's he saying, doctor? Even names of boys. He's been a great teacher. The most popular master Brookfield ever had. Yes, Chips has always known how to get along with boys. The most most popular popular master master Brookfield Brookfield ever ever had. It's a good thing their memories aren't as long as mine. The most popular. (laughs) Knew how to handle boys, did I? Mr. Chipping, when you came to us from Melbury, I gather that uh, discipline was not always your strong point. Uh, No, I suppose not, sir. Well, it's largely a matter of experience. You have another chance here. Take a firm attitude from the beginning. That's the secret of it. If I could... If I could only... Only make friends with them. You will, Mr. Chipping. Well, there's the class. That's all, Mr. Chipping. Yes, sir. My knees were shaking as I faced them that day. But I managed... It wasn't difficult to learn to be a disciplinarian. All you had to do was set your jaw and speak firmly. But that was about all. You could command their respect, but uh, not their friendship. No, I was lonely those early days at Brookfield. You coming down to see the boys off on the four o'clock train, Chipping? No, I I have some packing to finish. Oh, most of the other masters are going down. After all, the summer holidays are a big event. Can't the packing wait? Well, I I have all these books. And oh, I... Are you taking all those books to the mountains? Uh, yes, I, I thought I'd spend the summer studying. Well, you'll, you'll have a little recreation too, won't you? Oh, yes, I'll, I, I'll 
Go for walks in the woods. Do you uh, know anyone up there? Uh, no, no, I... I like to get away from books for most of the summer. At least textbooks. I get a feeling moldy this time of the year. The, the dry rot sets in my brain. Really? Don't you feel it? Don't you want to get out and maybe fish and hunt and, and, and flirt with a girl? Uh, <clears throat> forget there's such a thing as Cicero and Calculus? Well, I... Uh, you may be right, Robertson. I, I might enjoy a lighter moment, come to think of it. Yes, I'll put a novel or two in my bags. <laughs> well, we'd better get down to the train. Are you coming, Chipping? Oh, no, you hurry along. They won't miss me. Uh, a pleasant summer to you, Robertson. Well, that's the last time we'll be hearing that for a few months. Pleasant holiday to you too, Chipping. I started that night for the mountains. It was the summer of my life, but I didn't know it. I'd been there, let me see, was it a week? Yes, it was just about a week. Late in the afternoon, I was climbing on Great Gable, and I saw a girl waving excitedly from a most dangerous-looking ledge. I made my way towards her, and then, as I came close to her, I saw that she was laughing. Now, see here, young woman, I don't know what you're laughing at. I climbed all the way up here because I thought you were in difficulty. Oh, well, it was very gallant of you. And please don't think me unappreciative. But if you could just see the expression on your face. <laughs> well, what on earth were you waving your arms about for if nothing was wrong with you? I was waving at a friend of mine just below you. Oh, well, in that case, well, good afternoon. <laughs> What's wrong? Oh, I'm afraid I shall have to... Sit down for a minute. Is it your ankle? I, I twisted it on that last incline. Oh, let me see it. Oh, no, please don't bother. I'll just sit down for a minute. Mm, be careful. Yeah. What's your name? Chipping. Well, mine's Catherine, Mr. Chipping. But my friends call me Kathy. What do your friends call you? Chipping. Well, what would you expect them to call me? Oh, something a little less formal than Chipping. And a little more friendly. And what might that name be? Oh, that name might be Chips. Mr. Chips. There's a jaunty name with a dash to it and a sense of humor. Chips, eh? Yeah, chips. Well. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Chips. I'll tell you what? Well, what do you do? Are you a butcher or a baker or a candlestick maker? I'm a schoolmaster. A schoolmaster? How wonderful. Wonderful? Yes, to stand in your classroom and see youth looking up at you. To know that you're influencing those who are going to grow up and matter to the world. Well, I never thought of it like that. I do my best, and that's about all anyone can do in any job. What's your school? Brookfield. Oh, yes, I've heard of it. It's very well thought of. Oh, yes, it is. Well, the sun's going down. I'd better be starting back. Where are you staying? At the hotel. Oh, I'll help you. I'm afraid this may be rather painful for you. You lean on me all you can. Here, give me your hands. Yes. I'll help you up. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Miss... Uh, um, what was it you said your friends called you? Kathy. May I? I should be honored, Mr. Chips. I never was able to remember which ankle it was I sprained, and I was sorry because I should have liked to have honored the one that had performed so signal a service. The hours of that summer were gold and silver, and each one is still a coin that I can hold in my hand and dream over. I never paid much attention to the cello before. It's rather a fine instrument, isn't it? I've played it ever since I was a child. What is the piece you're playing? It's a love song. It's been one of my favorites for a long time. When I was a little girl dreaming about a prince who had come riding on a big charger, I always heard this music in my heart. And did the prince ever come? Yes, he did. Oh, I see. And everything was as I dreamed it. 
the music, and the day, and the way he looked at me. Oh. Only one thing was different. He didn't come on a charger. He came limping up a mountain and walked straight into my dreams and said his name was Chipping. Kathy. Kathy, my dear, I... I, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know quite what to say, confound it. What do you want to say? What I want to say seems altogether too prosaic and old-fashioned. It's just... I, Catherine, my dear, will you do me the honor of being my wife? Oh, dear. Darling, I've been so frightened. I'm sorry, of course. I've been too impulsive. That's why you've been frightened. Oh, my dearest. I've been frightened to death. You wouldn't ask me. Mr. Chips, look. A falling star. Let's wish on it. What did you wish? That we'd always be as happy as we are this moment. What did you wish? That you'd never leave me. She stood beside me in her mother's wedding dress, wearing a veil that five Irish grandmothers had worn before her. And then, those words that I was to be proud about forever. I, Catherine, take thee, Robert, to my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Until death, I'll stay forward. Chips, you look so handsome. Well, I... I'm, I'm confounded. It's warm tonight. Oh, I'm going to love it here at Brookfield. We must have some of the boys over every afternoon for tea. The boys? For tea? Of course. You can get acquainted with them much better in your own home than across a desk. Well, possibly. We, we, we'd better be starting, Kathy. We don't want to be late for our own reception. Whatever you say, Mr. Chips. Oh, and Kathy, please, don't, don't call me that in, uh, in front of anyone, will you? It, uh, it wouldn't be dignified. All right, darling. But I do think it's a very becoming name. Well, you know, in front of everyone. My dear, I'll try my best to remember. Kathy, I feel like a schoolboy instead of a schoolmaster. Oh, Kathy, I don't deserve you. Never have, never shall. I love you too, Mr. Chips, with all my heart. Come on, my dear, there's a reception waiting for us. Congratulations. Oh, Robertson, I'm glad to see you. My dear, this is Mr. Robertson, one of the masters. How do you do, Mrs. Chipping? I, uh, I hope you'll be happy here with us. Thank you. Hello there, Chipping. Good evening, Mr. Collins, my dear. I'd like you to meet another of the masters, Mr. Collins. How do you do, Mr. Collins? I've heard my husband speak of you so often. I'm very happy to meet you. I say, how did old Chipping ever get you? <laughs> oh, Mr. Collins, if you only knew the trouble I had getting Mr. Chipping. Uh, good evening, Chipping, and this is Mrs. Chipping, I suppose. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, this is Mr. Weatherby, dear, the headmaster of Brookfield. How do you do, Mr. Weatherby? Uh, Mrs. Chipping, welcome to Brookfield. We are happy to have you with us, and very glad indeed to see you both so happy. Thank you, Mr. Weatherby. You know, Mrs. Chipping, I've known your husband over 20 years, and I've never seen him looking better. Yes. You're a very handsome man, Mr. Chips. Kathy. Will you do me the honor of this dance, Mrs. Chipping? With pleasure, Mr. Weatherby. Uh, will you excuse us, Mr. Chips? Uh, of course, Mr. Weatherby. You know, um, Chipping? Yes, Robertson? I'm glad old Chipping couldn't return this autumn. You're glad what? Mr. Chips is going to be a lot more popular. I like Mr. Chips a great deal more than Mr. Chipping. Well, you know, so do I, Robertson. So do I.
In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of tonight's story, James Hilton's Goodbye, Mr. Chips. But first, I'd like to tell you the story of Angelo, the man with the green thumb. For you see, anyone who has the knack of raising flowers and plants is thought to have been born with a green thumb. Angelo's little house was in the poorer part of town, where factory smoke and soot sometimes hid the sunshine. But his garden was always a riot of color. He used no fancy garden tools, no expensive sprays, no costly plant foods. His secret lay in something else. As he explained it to a passerby one day in his quaint old world way, You see, mister, long time ago I think flowers are like people. So I make friends with them. I learn what they like. I give them affections. Affections make flowers very happy, just like people. Knowing what people like, knowing how to make people happy, has been the basis for the success of Hallmark cards. For those who make these fine greeting cards believe that anything so personal must have something special in the way of warmth and understanding. That's why you'll notice that Hallmark cards always seem to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. That's why you'll be able to find just the Hallmark card you want, no matter what the occasion. And that's why you can be so sure your friends will receive them with so much extra pleasure and remember you with so much extra affection. For when they turn the card over, as you did, and see the name Hallmark, they'll know you cared enough to send the very best. And now we return to James Hilton and Goodbye, Mr. Chips, starring Ronald Coleman. Old Mr. Chips lies quietly on his bed under the anxious eyes of his doctor and the headmaster of Brookfield. But his mind and heart are not on them. His mind and heart have raced back almost half a century to the days of his great love. Chips, darling, I've something to tell you. We're going to have a baby. Kathy. Did you ever hear of anything more exciting or more beautiful? Oh, Kathy, my oh, dear. Oh, Mr. Chips, he'll have your hair and your eyes and your laugh and fat, rosy cheeks. He'll be the most beautiful baby there ever was. And he'll be very bright, too, won't he? Oh, yes, the brightest boy in the school. Yes, he'll captain the team. He'll marry the prettiest girl in England. Yes. Oh, Chips, was there ever anything in the world so wonderful as having a baby? No, my dear, nothing. Mr. Chips, I love you so much. Oh, Kathy, I... Kathy, dearest... I know, my dear. I know. It seemed we had everything in the world, you and I. All oh, the dreams you gave me that year. I could see myself, headmaster at Brookfield, and on our own sons, growing up beside us. At first, you shared the excitement and the plans, and then, gradually, I began to get the uneasy feeling that though you smiled and said the right things, you didn't believe them. And my heart grew cold with a fear that prowled restlessly inside me and would not be stilled. And then, one day... Mr. Chipping, you're wanted right away at home. I'll take your class for you. Hurry, man, hurry! I don't understand, Doctor. I don't understand. Oh, Mr. Chipping, we've done everything possible. Oh, there must be something you can do. There must be something. If only there were. Her child was born dead. She should not have tried to have this baby. I warned her. She wanted a son so much. What shall I do? What can I do? You can come in with me now and sit with her and try not to let her see what you are feeling. Yes, Doctor. Come in. Kathy, my darling. Hello, Mr. Chips. You look tired. Did you have a hard day? Yes, I... Yes, it was a bit difficult. I told them not to call you until the last moment. I didn't want to 
worry you when there was nothing you could do. I'm very tired, Mr. Chips. I know, darling. You must rest. No. No, I've plenty of time for resting. You see, I know. Kathy. I'm glad I know. Because otherwise it might not occur to me to say thank you. Thank you for so many lovely things, Mr. Chips. I love you. I've never loved anyone else. I never shall. You've made me very happy. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Kathy. Kathy. Kathy, don't leave me. Oh, Kathy, don't leave me. Don't leave me. out into the sunlight, dazed, shocked. People passed me on the street and spoke, and it seemed unbelievable that the day could go on, and people could go on as though she were still part of the world. And then young Faulkner came up to me on the street. Please, sir, may I have the afternoon off? My people are coming up. Hmm, what's that? Oh, yes, yes. May I miss chapel too, sir? Yes, yes. And may I go to the station to meet them? I nodded and stumbled on. I took my fourth form as usual, setting them to learning grammar by heart. And, and I sat there staring at them, wanting to shout, She's dead. What do I care for verbs and adjectives when she's dead? And finally, the class was over. And as they filed out, someone stopped by the desk. Please, sir, there are a lot of letters for you. I looked, and so there were. I tore them open one by one, but each one contained only a blank sheet of paper. Then I realized it was April 1st, and this was a piece of April foolery. I began to laugh at the top of my lungs. I sat there laughing until I was completely worn out, and I fell asleep with my arms on my desk, and the pain dimmed and flickered and went out. And there was nothing but silence and darkness. And then once, oh, a long time after she had left me, someone spoke her name. It was a boy who came back for a visit. How is Mrs. Chipping, sir? I remember her very well. She had me in for tea one day. Oh, is that so? You remember her? Oh, you don't forget people like her. No, I suppose not. But there's no one here now who ever knew her. Oh, boys come and go, and even masters don't stay forever. She died, you know, oh, less than a year after you left, in 98. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, sir. She was a wonderful woman. That tea was one of the best afternoons I can remember. Oh, I wish it were then and not now. I'm off to France tomorrow. Oh. Oh, well. Godspeed, my boy. God bring you safely home. Months later, I heard that he'd been killed on the Somme, and then there was no one who remembered. But I remembered. Through the years that kept step with me, I remembered. When I became acting headmaster, she was there beside me. When there was a boy to be reprimanded, I saw her face looking back at me from a mirror, pleading for him. <laughs> and when I saw young people finding their own happiness, I saw her smiling at me. I loved her very much. Yes, the most popular master Brookfield ever had. Must have lived a lonely sort of life all by himself. Well, not always by himself. He married, you know. Oh, did he? Oh, I never knew about that. She died. It must have been all quite 30 years ago. More, possibly. 
Pity he never had any children. What's that? Did I hear one of you saying it was a pity I never had any children? <laughs> but I have, you know. I have. <laughs> thousands of them. Thousands of them. And all boys. <laughs> Pettifer, Pollitt, Borson, Potts. Oh, yes, and Pullman. You too, Purvis. Come round me now. All of you. Harper. Hazlitt. Oh, 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 Hatfield. Yes. And Heatherly. Wherever you go, whatever has happened, give me this moment with you. My boys. Bone. Boston. Bovey. Young Bradford. Close your eyes, Chips. Try to rest. Hey, what's that? Close your eyes, Chips. Try to rest. Kathy, what are you doing here? You're tired. I've come to sit beside you. Good night, Chips. Good night and goodbye, Mr. Chips. What's that, Kathy? What's that he's saying? He was saying goodbye, Mr. Chips. He was, eh? But you won't say it, will you? You won't say it? No, Mr. Chip. I won't say it. Ever again. moment, James Hilton will return to tell you about next week's story. Meantime, I'd like to remind you that there's nothing like one of those colorful Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe to make a child's eyes light up with joy. There are 16 dolls in all, including Little Miss Muffet, Cinderella, Little Boy Blue, and other childhood favorites. Each one wears a hat topped off by a jaunty plume that's a real feather. Each doll stands up by itself, and each one has a clever rhyme story about the doll inside. Children really love them. You couldn't ask for nicer favors or more appropriate place cards than these unique Hallmark dolls. And these colorful, feather-hatted Hallmark dolls are just as grand for children who live far away from you as for those in your own home. Hallmark dolls, you see, are just as easy to send as any Hallmark greeting card. And they cost only 25 cents each. See all 16 of the charming and colorful Hallmark dolls tomorrow at the store where you buy your Hallmark greeting cards. Now, here again is James Hilton. After that performance, Ronald Coleman, it doesn't surprise me at all that you won the Academy Award last year. And for the makers of Hallmark greeting cards, I would like to thank you for giving us such a memorable evening. Oh, the pleasure was mine, and I think you know Chips has always been one of my favorite characters. You know, you're lucky, Jimmy, to be able to present each week the best in literature, working with such nice people as those of Hallmark, who bring added pleasure to so many listeners at home. Yes, and like our Hallmark friends, we hope the program contributes a great deal to the happiness of many. And just as the doors of the Hallmark Playhouse are always open to you, Ronnie, I hope your doors will be open to us next week when we bring you Captain January, starring Lionel Barrymore and Luana Patton. And so, until next Thursday, this is James Hilton saying good night. Tonight's story was adapted for radio by Lynn Murray. With music composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, rather, the adaptation by Gene Holloway, our director producer is D. Engelback. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Next week, James Hilton returns to present Captain January, starring Lionel Barrymore and Luana Patton. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.